I want to thank everyone for listening tonight. I know that it is the end of a long day, and I hope that we can make this next hour or so interesting and informative. And again, I want to thank the National Association for Continents for their support, and especially to Allison Wilfong, and I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Now, the definition of a urinary tract infection is, in fact, an infection that occurs along the urinary tract. And UTIs, or urinary tract infections, we call them UTIs, have different names depending upon what part of the urinary tract is infected. And first of all, an infection in the bladder is called cystitis, or a bladder infection. And an infection in the kidneys, one or both kidneys, is called pyelonephritis, or a kidney infection. Now, the tubes that connect the kidneys to the bladder, one from the right kidney to the bladder and one from the left kidney to the bladder, are called the ureters. And these are tubes that take the urine from the kidney, each kidney, to the bladder. And very, very rarely are they the site of infection. The urethra, of course, is the little tube that leads from the bladder to the outside world and empties urine from the bladder to the outside. And an infection of the urethra is called urethritis. In women, the urethra is about four centimeters long or two and a half inches. In men, the urethra obviously is much longer. Now, a recurrent urinary tract infection or UTI is classified as someone who has three or more separate urinary tract infections per year. May I have the next slide? Now, most urinary tract infections arise from bacteria that live in our colon and in our rectum, and they're present normally in bowel movements. The bacteria cling to the opening of the urethra, they begin to multiply, and they travel up. They do a very sneaky thing. They travel all the way up to the bladder. Now, normally in a healthy person, uh, in normal uh, normal situations when we empty our bladders, both for men and for women, and my comments will apply tonight to both men and women, the urine flow from the bladder usually washes the bacteria out of the body. <clears throat> now, women, we tend to get more UTIs than men because our urethra, as I mentioned before, is very short and is much closer to the anus or rectum than in men. And women are more likely to get an infection, especially after sexual activity, because the distance between the vagina and the urethra is a very short distance, about an inch, an inch and a half. As a matter of fact, the opening of the urethra sits right at the 12 o'clock position in the vagina. And women, if you've ever taken a mirror and checked, you can see the opening of the urethra right at the 12 o'clock position. So it's extremely close. And during sexual activity, bacteria can get placed into the urethra and then the bladder and cause a UTI. Additionally, in menopause, when we lose our estrogen, our tissues get much thinner, so they're less able to fight infection. And estrogen normally creates a mucus plug in the urethra that allows the bacteria to, to be stopped right there at the front door at the urethra. When we lose the estrogen, we lose the glands that are nice and lush and produce mucus. We lose that. So the urethra becomes a little more open, and bacteria can also travel uh, right into the urethra and then into the bladder. May I have the next slide? <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, if you have certain conditions, you can be at increased risk for UTIs. These conditions include those listed on the slide. Now, diabetes can increase the risk of urinary tract infections because your blood sugar, when it is higher, um, allows the urine that is sitting in the bladder to uh, really grow bacteria a little bit better. And in fact, in diabetics, uh, many diabetics, especially if your sugars are not under the best control, um, your, you may not be emptying the bladder as well. Your bladder may not contract as efficiently as it normally uh, con uh, contracts when you didn't have diabetes. So you may leave urine in the bladder combined with a little high sugar in the blood. That can increase your risk of UTI or urinary tract infections. And as I mentioned, diabetics can have residual urine. Um, people who have conditions where the bladder doesn't contract that well can develop residual urine, and that can grow bacteria, 
whether or not you have diabetes, um, and that can increase UTI. Now, if you use a catheter to empty your bladder because your bladder really doesn't contract well, then repeated catheter use can also lead to UTIs. <clears throat> kidney stones, some kidney stones can lead to UTIs because the kidney stones themselves have bacteria in them and they may be coated with an antibody that makes treatment of a UTI very difficult. Most kidney stones do not have bacteria high count in them. However, they can cause blockages in the kidney, in the ureter, the tubes that lead from each kidney to the bladder, and in the bladder themselves. Bladder stones can lead to UTI because they can cause an obstruction. They can also be a focus for bacteria, like a little bacteria magnet. If you have bowel incontinence, it's a very short distance, both in men and women, but more in women, from the rectum to the vagina to the urethra, and in men from the rectum to the urethra. So if you have stool sitting there, it can sit right into the urethra and go right in and cause a UTI. Now, in pregnancy, the reason a baby can grow inside of us is that our immune systems for nine months are depressed or, or lowered, and that's the way that we can have another human being grow inside of us. But because of that depressed immune system, unfortunately, we can be more susceptible to infections. We all know personally or friends and family members, when they're pregnant, when we're pregnant, we catch colds, for instance, a lot easier, especially in cold weather. Um, and that's why it's important for women to get flu shots, pregnant women to get flu shots. Uh, and at any rate, pregnant women are at increased risk uh, to get uh, bladder uh, infections. As you get older, as we get older, our margin for infections and continence gets, uh, gets a narrower. So it takes a little bit less to give us a UTI, to get a UTI as we get older. Uh, because the tissues, the nerves, muscles, and connective tissues don't function as well. And also, if you've had any surgery, um, this may cause scar tissue, obviously. And if you've had surgery, especially bladder surgery, pelvic reconstructive surgery, that may place you at increased risk for incontinence. And at the end of the webinar, I'll go into detail about that a little bit. If you're staying in bed for long periods of time, if you're recovering from surgery, you may be at increased risk for UTI because you may not get out of the bed to go to the bathroom. It may be a, a very big effort for you to get up and go to the bathroom. You may not feel like using that bedpan again if you've been told not to move, and the urine may sit in the bladder longer, and urine sitting in the bladder is a perfect culture medium. It just grows bacteria and uh, much more easily. So it's very important to realize that as well if you've had surgery in your, your bedroom. Um, if you have an enlarged prostate, and for women who have large degrees of pelvic organ prolapse where the organs drop or sag. That can cause an obstruction of the urethra. Men with a large prostate squeezes the urethra, that tube that leads from the bladder to the outside world. In women, a dropped bladder can kind of compress the urethra against the pubic bone, causing a blockage, and that may lead to increased residual urine, which, as you know by now, leads to UTIs. As I mentioned in one of the other earlier slides, sexual intercourse can deposit bacteria in the urethra and lead to UTIs, as well as contraceptive spermicides and diaphragms. Contraceptive spermicides may kill sperm, but they also may kill very good bacteria as well. And that can lead to UTIs because the vaginal uh, environment, especially before menopause, is protective. It's an acid pH, a low pH, and that can really help also prevent UTIs in addition to a good estrogen level. Um, diaphragms compress the urethra um, against the, the um, pubic bone and can uh, trap urine and lead to increased residual urine and, once again, UTIs. Next slide, please. After menopause, estrogen levels drop, and yet another reason for menopause, increasing the risk of UTI, is that when our estrogen levels drop, not only do, does the mucus seal of the urethra sort of disappear, but the vaginal pH, which is normally low and acid, um, rises because vaginal lactobacilli, the good bacteria, which prevents the growth of Intestinal bacteria from the, from the colon coming into the vagina, it prevents that from growing 
in the vagina and in the urethra. So when we lose our lactobacillus, those lactobacilli are wonderful. They lower the vaginal pH, preventing vaginal infections and urinary tract infections. But when we lose the good bacteria, it makes us more susceptible to UTI. So our naturally occurring estrogen helps prevent recurrent UTI in women. And what I'll touch on a little bit later and maybe in the Q&A is that you can um, use different preparations to lower the vaginal pH. Again, there are many preparations over the counter that are like a vaginal probiotic. Also, taking an oral probiotic may also help the vaginal milieu or environment and lower the pH in the vagina and make the risk of UTI less because the uh, bacteria from the rectum can't really even make it into the urethra uh, as, as, um, as much. Now, indwelling catheters are associated, whether they're indwelling catheters, a suprapubic catheter, or if you intermittently catheterize yourself, catheters are associated with colonization of bacteria on the catheter and an increased risk of clinical UTI or infection. Now, single-use catheter, sterile catheter, does reduce these risks. It doesn't prevent the UTI from occurring. So it is important for you to maintain proper care and use of your catheter at all times, and you remain alert to the symptoms of UTI because, as you'll see later, that can lead to um, an infection, ascending infection, we call it, into the kidneys. So you want to prevent that. And um, catheters also, uh, as I mentioned, present a risk of recurring UTIs. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about proper care for intermittent catheterization. In other words, if your bladder doesn't empty well and your physician or provider has told you that you do need to learn intermittent catheterization in order to reduce your risk of UTI, you need to maintain proper care and management of your catheter and of all of your tools. So the equipment, it's very, very important. So here are some general instructions listed on this slide. You can all see this. You want to gather your equipment first. For women, a mirror is really essential till you get used to the location of the urethra by feel. Uh, bath soap and a clean towel, a water-soluble lubricant such as KY jelly. You don't want to use Vaseline because the petroleum products uh, cause the bacteria to stick. Uh, to the catheter and may cause a UTI, and I'll touch on that again in a moment, and you want to use a new sterile catheter. So you want to arrange your clothing so it's not in your way. You want to sit and you want to urinate on your own, and I tell all my patients when you're urinating, just rem remember to sit down on the toilet seat. Don't try to squat. Squatting leads to incomplete emptying of the bladder, which as you all know now, probably knew before, can lead to urinary tract infections or UTIs. So you urinate on your own now. Even if you're able to urinate a large amount, you may still have some urine in your bladder that must be emptied in order to prevent an infection. Um, so you want to proceed. You want to make sure you listen to your provider and doctor's instructions and proceed as follows. You wash your hands with regular bath soap and water. Then you want to wash the area of your urethral opening, which is known as the perineal area. You all know you wipe from front to back, from the urethra back to the anus. And you want to use the bath soap and water to wipe and wash carefully. Now, if you're out of the house and you need to catheterize, you can carry antiseptic wipes, such as baby wipes, when you're away from home. But you don't want to use that every day. You want to go ahead and use a nice clean towel and nice regular bar of bath soap. You open your catheter packaging after you've assembled all your equipment. You want to open the lubricant tube. And I want to mention that you want to open the catheter first before the lubricant tube because if you open the lubricant tube first, you may get a little lubricant on your hands and opening the catheter may be difficult, may be too slippery. You want to apply a generous amount of lubricant to the first few inches of the catheter. The lubricant can be purchased at most drug stores, and as I mentioned, it needs to be water-soluble, like a KY jelly, not a Vaseline product, not a petroleum-based product, because the bacteria, again, can stick uh, to the lubricant and to the catheter and cause a bladder infection. So again, you want to sit on the toilet or a firm surface, you want to lean back, and you want to go ahead and place the catheter and allow the bladder to drain. 
And um, for men, you want to place the tip of the lubricated catheter into the urethra according to your doctor's instructions and allow the bladder to drain. May I have the next slide? How do you know if you have a UTI? Well, there are many symptoms. Some are obvious and some are subtle. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may have pain in your back. If you put your hands on your hips and where your thumbs land on both sides, on your right tip of your thumb and your left tip of your thumb, that's where the kidneys are on the right and left side. So you may have pain in that area right above the hip, and you may have pain in the lower abdomen, lower in your pelvis, or you may just have a pressure or a very strange feeling. You also may experience frequency of urination or urgency of urination, or it may be painful to urinate. You may notice that your urine is cloudy or bloody, or it may have a strong odor, and you may have a fever. People may have one of these or all of these, and sometimes in the elderly, you may have none of these. You may just not feel like yourself, and we'll go over that on the next slide. Next slide, please. In the elderly, remember I said that some symptoms are very obvious and some are very subtle. In the elderly, a urinary tract infection can easily be overlooked. And the reason why this is so serious is that as you get older, our immune systems get a little bit lowered. And an infection can take off and affect our entire system, not just going up from the bladder to the ureters to the kidney, but it can get into our bloodstream and cause what's called uh, septicemia or septic state, and that can be extremely serious. When this happens in the urinary system, it's called, from the urinary system, it's called urosepsis. <clears throat> so we also may not have our elderly reporting obvious symptoms that younger people have, such as frequency, urgency, or difficult urination, pain. And the symptoms, again, may be vague, and they are listed here. Uh, people may just think, oh, it's just a normal part of aging. So confusion. Confusion can be because of a UTI with bacteria in the bloodstream. It may affect the entire system and make you confused. You may generally feel not well, flu-like symptoms, general discomfort, a little disorientation, very tired. You may feel weak. You may notice in yourself or your relatives that are elderly that may have a UTI, changes in their behavior. They may be falling more because of the disorientation and confusion and weakness, and they may have incontinence. For instance, the most common bacteria that affects men and women both is the E. coli bacteria. That's the bacteria that grows in the colon and rectum. Now, if E. coli gets into the bladder and into the bloodstream and causes well, a UTI to start with, um, it can cause the tissue that causes the urethra to shut, which is called a sphincter, which is similar to the sphincter in the rectum or anus. It can cause the sphincter to relax, and that can actually cause incontinence. So remember I said our continence margins get narrower as we get, as we get older. So all it may take in an elderly woman, say you know, a 90, 95-year-old woman, all it may take is one E. coli urinary tract infection to open up that sphincter, the tissue that's, that's holding the urine back. It may open up, and an E. coli infection may be the cause of incontinence. So it's very, very important to report these symptoms to your doctor, your provider, your family member. Make sure to get treatment. Um, many elderly people feel, you know, they, they really want to be independent, and I completely understand that. I think everyone wants to be independent. But especially as you get older, you really cling to that independence, and it becomes extremely central and important. But don't be too proud to report your symptoms to your doctor or a family member. Please speak up. It can be life-saving. So along those lines, may I have the next slide? Do I need to go to the doctor? Well, my patients are not shy to call me, and I make sure that they can contact me because I want to catch this when it's a urinary tract infection, 
before it gets to the kidneys and before it gets to the bloodstream. So if you have symptoms of a UTI, please contact your health care provider. It may be life-saving. Especially call immediately if you have vomiting or fever or mental changes or confusion. If your skin is flushed, that signs usually signs of a, of a systemic infection or an infection in the whole body. If you have pain, as I mentioned before, in your back or your side, obviously if you have shaking and chills, this is very, very serious and may be signs of a possible kidney infection. So please, please call your doctor. We are in this profession to help people, and I hear this Many, many times, well, I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to call you on the weekend. I didn't want to call you at night. And I tell everybody the same thing. I would like to hear from you so that we can help a small problem disappear rather than have a big problem and maybe have a really hard time getting it to be treated. So please call your doctor. Next slide, please. So how do we tell if you have a UTI? Well, first of all, we collect a urine sample, a sterile sample, with the wipes that we give you in that nice little cup. A urine sample is usually collected to perform a urinalysis. We may look under the microscope, and we send a urine culture to see if there are bacteria. And if we really need to find out if there are other complications or if there are other organs affected, from a UTI, we may get a CAT scan of your abdomen, a scan of the kidneys, an ultrasound of the kidneys, and something called an IVP or an intravenous pilogram, which basically outlines the kidney a little bit more specifically for us. Now, the urinalysis is done to look for white blood cells, red blood cells, bacteria, and to test for nitrites, something called nitrites. And if one or more of those are present, that signifies that there probably is a UTI present. And again, we collect a clean catch urine to identify the bacteria in the urine. And you clean off, you urinate a little in the bowl, and collect the midstream of the urine, and then we send that to the laboratory. But usually we can tell while you're in the office from the microscopic examination, uh, if there, in fact, is a UTI present in conjunction, of course, with taking a good history from you and doing a thorough physical examination. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so how do we treat UTIs? Now, this depends on the severity or the seriousness of the infection. It can be treated with a pill with oral antibiotics. And if it's a simple UTI, a three-day course uh, usually suffices. And some infections may need to be treated for several days or weeks even. The length of the time we treat you depends upon the type of antibiotic prescribed and the seriousness of the infection. And even if a few doses of medication, let's say you take, you know, pills for the two days, Let's say it's twice a day. You feel, oh, I'm fine. Don't have to continue the medication. But you still need to complete the full course of the medication as prescribed by your doctor. And if you have pain or other symptoms, you're uncomfortable, you can take according and to your doctor's instructions, aspirin or Tylenol, acetaminophen, or other drugs that are called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. We, the short version of that is called an NSAID non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. They may reduce your symptoms of pain during this episode, and also it may help reduce your fever if you do have a fever. Symptoms, if a simple bladder infection, if it's just in the bladder, they usually disappear within 24 to 48 hours after treatment begins, and once again, please take the full course of the antibiotic. Now, if you have a kidney infection, it may take a week or even longer for your symptoms to actually uh, disappear. Now, for serious kidney infections, you may receive fluids and antibiotics through an intravenous or an IV. <clears throat> in very serious cases, and this is in the definitely in the minority of cases, you may need to be hospitalized or have home care and take antibiotics and fluids through an intravenous. 
chronic urinary tract infections may need antibiotics for many months or stronger antibiotics may be prescribed. Now, I want to stress that antibiotics do not necessarily need to be prescribed just because bacteria is found in the urine. And generally, it is if symptoms are present um, or if we have somebody who has a chronic UTI that does need to be treated with bacteria, but we do go according to patient symptoms. We do get a little bit more aggressive <clears throat> treating UTIs in the elderly, and I do have to mention that antibiotics obviously uh, there is nothing without a side effect. Antibiotics themselves can cause other bigger problems, such as stomach upset, diarrhea, and painful yeast infections. So we don't take giving antibiotics lightly. We do want to treat and prevent a kidney infection and uh, an infection in the body. So we do have to weigh the risks and benefits. May I have the next slide, please? No. An ounce of prevention is truly worth, as the saying goes, a pound of cure in this case. Usually, if somebody has a chronic infection and doesn't have an abnormality in the structure of your urethra, bladder, ureters, kidneys, we can usually trace an infection to something that, uh, that could be prevented or could have been done to reduce the likelihood of a UTI, not to 100% prevent, but to prevent to a large degree. Now, what can we do? A lot goes back to bathroom behavior, hygiene, and bathing. I tell my patients, especially my elderly patients, showers instead of baths, two showers a day, morning and evening, for somebody especially who gets chronic UTIs, wash the day away, wash the bacteria off. So, of course, you want to keep your genital area clean and proper hygiene in caring for the urethral area is another way to limit the type of bacteria that can be drawn into the urethra from the rectum and from the vagina. And this is especially true in people who have decreased sensation in the perineal region, such as people who have multiple sclerosis or people who experience fecal incontinence. So you want to keep the genital area clean. You want to use soap and water or cleansing wipes. If you're away from home, if you use absorbent pads, please change them frequently as, as they can become wet. And for women who use pads chronically, uh, you can get a rash from the pad. So you want to be sure and take that mirror from one of those first slides that I asked you to, to have around and take a look at the vulva, the area uh, around the uh, outside of the vagina, the perineal area. If it looks red or chapped, either see your provider call. There are, th from the chronic, um, chronic infection um, or even any uh, incontinence, you may want to ask your physician about using something to protect the perineal area. Now, women should always wipe from front of the vagina to the back of the anus every time after urination or a bowel movement, and I know probably everyone listening tonight realizes this. Now, there are lots and lots of products. If you walk into your local drugstore, you'll see bubble baths and bath oils and sprays and feminine sprays and powders, and <clears throat> I like to compare the vagina and the urethral area, the perineal area, in men and women as a self-cleaning oven. Um, we can really, uh, really, it can really stay clean without the benefit, quote-unquote benefit, of all of these products. So basically, showers instead of baths, one to two a day, avoiding all those fancy bubble baths, bath oils, and sprays. And menstrual pads are probably better to use instead of tampons, which some physicians believe make infections more likely uh, because it sort of shortens the distance between the vagina and the urethra and it makes it more likely for the bacteria to travel directly into the urethra, like a little subway car for the bacteria to get right into the urethra. And obviously change your pad each time you use the bathroom because if you are trying to save money by making the pad last as long as possible, the um, aggravation that you'll have from a subsequent urinary tract infection or a rash probably isn't worth the price to say nothing of the cost of the antibiotics that you might have to use if you develop a UTI. And once again, no douching uh, or using feminine hygiene sprays or powder or perfumes, nothing like this in the genital area. Um, most people who notice um, that they do need some assistance with hygiene in addition to showers 
<clears throat> I recommend the vaginal probiotic gels that are on the market. Um, and if there are questions later about, uh, about estrogen uh, preparations, I can address those. But basically, the probiotics that are over the counter or even taking an oral probiotic once a day can reduce the pH in the vagina, make it more acid, and make the likelihood of bacteria traveling to the urethra much less likely. It also will... Um, help the perineal and the vaginal area. Uh, when you have a low pH, you don't get an odor. You just uh, simply uh, don't get an odor. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> if you are sexually active uh, with a partner or uh, if you're sexually active with yourself, it is still important to urinate before and after sexual activity. If you're sexually active in any part of the spectrum, you need to empty your bladder for men and women before and after sexual activity. You want to jump into the shower before and after or clean your genital and anal area before and after sexual activity in any way, in the shower um, or with cleansing wipes. You want to use soap and water or the wipes. You want to obviously obviously restrict your number of sexual partners and this is just as true in the elderly if you are dating someone if you're widowed or a widower you want to make sure that you limit your number of partners you cannot tell um, if someone has a sexually transmitted infection by looking at them so um, and some physicians encourage women who've had a history of recurrent urinary tract infections to take a prophylactic antibiotic either before or after sexual intercourse one pill usually does the trick, and that can reduce the risk of a chronic or subsequent urinary tract infection. We all know the story about the cotton underwear. These days, they make really nice underwear for men and women um, with a cotton crotch. So you want to wear cotton underwear for the women. If you wear pantyhose, a cotton crotch. Um, pro, you know, if you do have chronic UTIs, there is some good literature regarding um, underwear, uh, for example, may not always be necessary if you're wearing a long skirt or if you're home especially. Uh, long skirts uh, pretty much do the trick, and you can let the vaginal or perineal area breathe a little bit better. The more air you can get to that area, the less likely a UTI. So along those lines. You want to avoid wearing thong undergarments. I have to tell you, I don't understand thong undergarments. We've done some writing about the subject, and to me, a thong is like a bact If I was a bacteria, I would jump on that thong so I could travel directly from the rectum into the urethra. So I think thongs really are, are really increase the risk of UTI. Same with tight-fitting pants. Um, the perineal area, the urethra just basically is, has absolutely no oxygen. The vagina... Uh, pH climbs and bacteria go from the rectum to the vagina to the urethra and in men from the, uh, from the rectum to the urethra uh, with tight-fitting garments of any sort. You want to obviously, I know we all change our underwear at least once a day, and again, I, I just want to reiterate that to make sure we all, we all do that. Um, I want to mention that prophylactic antibiotics if you do have chronic UTIs and you are instructed to take a, an antibiotic after intercourse, before after intercourse, it reduces the risk of another UTI, but about 85%. But I want to mention again, as I alluded to before, you don't want to overuse antibiotics because that will promote the development of resistant bacteria, and you don't want to develop a resistant bacteria because then your UTI will be very, very hard to treat. Next slide, please. So again, you want to make sure to drink plenty of water. If you have no cardiac condition, I tell people to take their body weight, with how much they weigh today, not where they want to be, and cut that amount in half. Let's say you weigh 140 pounds, so you want to drink 70 ounces of fluid a day. Uh, a little bit more in the summertime, again, if you don't have a heart problem and with the advice of your physician. So about 70 ounces, it's not just water. It is anything you can pour constitutes a liquid. So that can be coffee or tea or juice um, or soup. Anything that you can pour is a liquid, so about half of your body weight. Um, you may want to add some cranberry juice or tablets to your diet because, again, that will help lower the pH of the vagina and your urine and make a UTI much less likely. There are fluids that irritate the bladder. 
such as alcohol, drinks with some of the artificial sweeteners, diet sodas, um, can cause uh, quite a bit of bladder irritation. And for some people, caffeine is a bladder irritant. Now, there are people who uh, do not feel that these, any of these are bladder irritants, and there are those who will react adversely and they will irritate their bladder with any of these substances can cause their bladder irritation. So you have to just um, leave, if you're curious, you can leave um, caffeine out, for instance, for a week or two and see if, you know, you feel better and that will, um, with any of your bladder symptoms, and that will kind of cue you in that that may be an irritant for you. And the same with the, some of the artificial sweeteners. As I mentioned before, um, the risk of UTI can be reduced by using um, estrogen, because it repopulates the normal vaginal lactobacillus that keep bacteria from the rectum from multiplying and causing a bladder infection. Now, these must, must, must be prescribed by your healthcare provider. They are not over the counter. The estrogens are in the form of either a vaginal estrogen cream. I'm talking about local estrogen now. I'm not talking about estrogen pills or patches, just right around the area of the vagina and the bladder. So vaginal creams, and they can be used twice or three times a week with the, um, with the um, blessing of your health care provider. And everyone's health care situation is different, and so you need to really discuss this. And this may reduce the risk of UTI by repopulating the lactobacillus and reducing the risk of UTI. So estrogen comes in the form of a cream, as well as a vaginal estrogen pill called Vagifem, the 10 microgram vaginal pill that's twice a week. And there are vaginal estrogen rings. There are two types available, and those may reduce UTIs. And again, with your healthcare provider. I want to mention that the use of cranberry products seem to decrease the ability of the bladder to adhere, the bacteria to adhere to the lining of the urethra and bladder decreases adherence of bacteria to the urethra and bladder. And the thing is that cranberry juice can have a high amount of sugar, so the cranberry extract, what we really need to lower the pH and help our um, help ourselves uh, develop less UTIs or maybe no UTIs, cranberry extract can be taken in the form of a capsule or a pill form instead. Now, if you do have the drink form, be sure that if it's a cranberry drink, um, that that's only about 10% of cranberry juice. Um, you really want to just get the juice and not the drink because that has a lot of sugar and very, very little active cranberry. Next slide, please. The last uh, slide or two, I want to talk about the uh, use of catheters and UTIs. Now, it's very, very, very important to properly cl cleanse and store your catheters um, in people who intermittently catheterize because the catheter can be a vehicle to introduce infection and bacteria into the bladder. So if the technique you use is incorrect or the catheters aren't properly cleansed, this could accelerate or exacerbate a urinary tract infection. Now, a closed system catheter provides a reliable means of sterile intermittent catheterization because the introducer tip is surrounded <clears throat> by a urine collection bag and is never exposed to bacteria typically found at the urethral opening, which greatly reduces the risk of infection. So I believe my last slide before we take questions has to do with new research regarding urinary tract infection. So may I have the next slide, please? Now, women, some interesting points. Women who have a positive urine culture, the day they have surgery for a pelvic floor disorder, are more likely to have a UTI in the first six weeks after the procedure. And one in five patients who undergo surgery for a pelvic floor dis disorder develops a UTI following the procedure. So we're now looking into, we're doing further research so we can decide how we determine how we manage patients preoperatively as well as postoperatively to prevent UTIs. And this research comes from the Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine, which was presented at the most recent meeting of the American Urogynecologic Society, which was held just a month or so ago in Chicago, Illinois. So we know uh, basically that you know the main research these days is evaluating how we can prevent UTIs 
uh, post-operatively because people really do not need a UTI after they w- they've gone through a whole surgery for their um, con- pelvic floor condition. On top of this, to get a UTI is extraordinarily uh, unpleasant. So I believe that we'll go to the last slide and take some questions. Be glad to take questions, and I want to thank NAFC again, and I want to thank um, Allison Wilfong and her, the whole staff at National Association for Continence, Bladder Health Week, very, very exciting events going on. And I want to remind you that participants in tonight's webinar are all entered for a chance to win a mission-critical UTI DVD, which is an educational DVD detailing prevention information, hand hygiene demonstration, and urinary catheter practices and self-catheterization instructions. And I believe everyone listening tonight will be entered in that contest to win this marvelous, informative DVD. And now I'm going to go ahead and be very, very happy to take your questions. So I see that I have a question. Um, Regarding one of our listeners, her mother is 88. I'm going to read the question, and this again is anonymous. My mom is 88 and has chronic UTIs every other month. She takes Leviquin because of allergic reactions to other antibiotics. Her urologist has recommended Allura. Well, is this safe? Her GP recommends D-Manos, and is this safe? Allura is one of the most studied cranberry preparations nationally. And it has an, it's a once-a-day pill, and it is safe provided she's not taking, if she was taking some of the other antibiotics, um, not Leviquin, safe with Leviquin. If she's taking some antibiotics, um, people should not take cranberry preparation with certain antibiotics. There are very few that you can't um, take the cranberry with. Most you can. So check with your health care provider. But with Leviquin, the Allura is wonderful. It's a once-a-day pill. Um, I want to mention also in the elderly, you really have to make sure if she can possibly shower twice a day. If she can possibly, um, if she's using pads, make sure those pads are clean. If her doctor can take a look and see if there's chafing or chapping of the perineal area because of pad use, if she can put something on the perineal area, which I didn't mention in the general webinar, but something like um, a zinc oxide preparation, uh, desitin, um, aquaphor, something that's very soothing that will prevent uh, not a Vaseline preparation, something that will soothe the, the area. It may make it less inflamed and less likely for bacteria to go from the rectum to the urethra, through the vagina to the urethra. So that is also safe. Demanos is, is, is safe. However, um, I have much more experience with the cranberry preparations and being effective. So I want to thank you, that, li- that listener for the, her excellent question, and I hope your mom does very, very well. I have a question from a listener. What is the safest way to um, to reuse catheters? I want to go back uh, to uh, one of our slides um, in terms of, of um, proper catheter use. Uh, it's very, very important for catheter reuse. You need to make sure that the catheter is washed very, very carefully with uh, good, uh, very warm soap and water and make sure it's rinsed thoroughly and that no petroleum product was used near that catheter. And again, to follow these instructions um, regarding um, proper preparation for when you're ready to catheterize yourself, You need to, again, make sure you're using bar soap and a clean towel and you assemble your equipment and you open, uh, you wash your catheter very, very thoroughly and you go ahead and use your uh, water-soluble lubricant, a mirror if you have to. Make sure that catheter is really clean and the perineal area is really clean. And by reducing the bacterial count on that catheter to as close to zero as you can and reducing the bacterial count in your perineal area, at least for the time that you've washed the perineal area and you're going to insert the catheter, um, and of course remember to 
to to urinate before you um, before you place the catheter to try to empty as much as you can. Not to push, but just to sit down on the on the toilet and empty, and then go ahead and clean the area, clean the catheter, assemble everything, and that probably will be um, the the safest way for you to go ahead uh, and reuse the safest um, the safest way. So I want to thank the listener for that question. I have another question from a listener. What can be done regarding chronic UTIs in children? Is this something to be concerned with? Well, I have to tell you, um, being a mom, sometimes it's not so easy to get your child into the shower or the bath. Children tend to take baths. And um, I will recommend that uh, the the child showers, again, once or twice a day rather than sitting in a bathtub Um, which is sometimes, especially for children who may not bathe every day, kind of like sitting in a bacterial soup. So I think showering would be a very good idea, making sure um, that you are teaching them to wipe correctly and if you need to, especially with young children, and watch them and instruct them. And this is how you wipe. And you may need to to check and and make sure um, the urethra doesn't have feces around it because if children don't wipe after they they have a bowel movement, um, that bacteria, all it takes, that area in children is such a tiny area between the rectum um, and the urethra. It's a much smaller smaller area, obviously, than in adults. Uh, So you need to make sure that there's no stool around there and that they're keeping the perineal area very clean, showering once or twice a day, changing their underwear every day, cotton crotch underwear. Um, If they're young ladies, then no thongs, please. Um, And uh, that would be um, a very good start anyway. Another question. My UTI seems to be gone. Do I still need to... Hang on one second. Do I still need to take the rest of my medication? As I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned before, urinary tract insect infection symptoms will start to go away between 24 to 48 hours. By two days of medication, you may say, what do I need to take the rest of this antibiotic for? I'm all better. Well, the fact is, if your physician checked the bacteria count and type, uh, he or she will have prescribed for you the correct amount of bacteria for the correct amount of days, and it is extraordinarily important for you to complete that entire course of antibiotic, even if you feel completely better. If you stop before the course that has been prescribed is over, you run the risk of, A, developing a resistance to the bacteria the next time you take it. It might not work, um, and we try to give the most... um, uh, the most, the safest type of medications and antibiotics as we can, ones that are associated with the least amount of side effects. So you don't want to go through, you know, several antibiotics and become resistant to them over time. So you want to go ahead and complete it. So all of those bacteria have been completely eradicated. And while you're on an antibiotic, uh, and and even as much as possible, I do recommend for women a vaginal probiotic. Um, and or an oral probiotic, and for men also for, with chronic UTIs, an oral probiotic, very important to keep the pH of the urine low, and for women to keep the pH of the vagina uh, and the urine low. So probiotic, very, very important. I tell my patients that using a vaginal probiotic, we spend so, ma- so much time with our makeup, making, making up our face. We have foundation, we have moisturizer, we have everything you can name. But the perineal area, the poor perineal area, really doesn't get as much attention as it should. So a nice shower once or twice a day. You want to make sure to use um, a barrier if you have, if a barrier on the perineal area if, if you have leakage so that the skin doesn't get irritated. Um, a vaginal probiotic as prescribed by your physician, an estrogen preparation only prescribed by your physician to lower the pH additionally. And you really want to take as good care, I tell my patients, I want you to take as good care of your perineal area and your vagina and urethra as you do of your face. 